introduction to local storage in Thunkable. Local storage is a method for storing data in your Thunkable app so that it's available the next time you open the app. Let's consider a metaphor for a moment. If I'm unloading the dishwasher and I pull out a spoon and want to store it, I hand it to you and say, put this spoon in the spoon slot in the cutlery drawer. So you take the spoon and put it in the spoon slot in the cutlery drawer. Now, when I go to set the table, I say, get me a spoon from the cutlery drawer, please. And you go to the cutlery drawer and you get a spoon out of the spoon slot and you pass it to me. Local storage is kind of like that. I have data, which are the spoons, and local storage, which is the cutlery drawer, and the spoon slot, which is the key that is used by local storage to identify some data. Let's take a look at a very simple example. In Thunkable, I've created an app that has a store button, a retrieve button, and a text entry box for me to enter some data. I'm going to run the app, and I'll type in some information, and click Store. Now I'll close the app, and then open it back up again. And when I click the Retrieve button, it pulls the information back out. So that shows that the information was taken from the text box and stored in local storage because it was there when I restarted the app again. Now let's take a look at the blocks and see what's going on. When we click the Store button, we call the Save function in local storage. We pass it a key called Answer. And we give it the value that is basically whatever I had put into the text input box. Then it resets the text box to empty for the demonstration. So the two key pieces here are the answer and the value. Going back to our spoon and cutlery drawer metaphor, the key is like saying the spoon slot. The local storage, remember, is the cutlery drawer. And the value is the spoon, or it's the piece of data in this case that I'm passing to it. When we want to retrieve the data, when we want to do the opposite effect, we basically call the get function from local storage. We tell it what piece of information we want to get. We want to get that answer that we stored up here. It's going to return whatever's in that answer spot as value. And then we can tell it to change the input box to be whatever came back in value. So here, we took a piece of data from text input and we stored it in a place called answer. We did the opposite thing when we wanted to retrieve the data. We went to that place called answer got whatever's there as value, and displayed it in the text input box. Now let's look at a more complicated example where we're actually working with a list viewer and a list of data. We've got selection of buttons here, add, load, save, and clear. The add button is going to be taking whatever's on this text input box, adding it to the list. The load is to allow me to pull back whatever information I've saved. The save button obviously saves it and the clear button erases the list. Let's see the app in action first. I'll type in some data. So I've added in four pieces of data. I'll click Save. Now I can close the app and open it again. If I click Load, it shows me the data that was saved. Clicking Clear erases the list. Load brings it back. So all of the functions are working. Let's take a look at what's happening in each of the blocks. The first thing to note is we've got a variable here named list that is being initialized. So right when this app starts, it initializes this variable called list and it assigns it to be an empty list. So we've got a variable named list and it is an empty list. Now I've got a function that says when add button, we're going to add to the list. So I'll just take a look at that briefly. If we expand out that block, what it's doing is whenever I click that button, it calls this function and it says take whatever's on the text input field and insert it into the variable list. So we've got our list. Whenever we click that button, it takes whatever's been input and puts it into the list. Then it updates the list viewer to show whatever's in that list and then it resets the text box to be empty again. So that allows us to add some information to the list. So when we click the save button, we go to local storage and we use the save function in local storage. We say, hey, I want to take this, take some data 
and I want to save it in a place called my list. So that's what we pass as the key. What we pass to it is the variable that we've created, which is that list. So we've been building up the list. We take that list and we pass it to the save function. It stores it into local storage in a place called my list. When we click the load button, we perform an opposite function. We use the get function from local storage. We tell it what we want to get and we identify my list. So that's what we call it when we saved it. That function returns something called value. That value will be whatever is stored in my list. If we had store, if we had told it to just store one piece of information, it would contain one piece of information. But in this case, we had told it to store a list. So this value is going to return a list. So we take that list that's returned to us and we assign it to our variable that we called list, which is an, which is a list. And then we tell the list viewer to display whatever's in that variable. Just to recap, we asked local storage to get us whatever was in the place called my list. It gave us back something called value, which contained whatever was in that spot. We then assigned the, our variable, which was a list, to be whatever came back from that get request. Then we updated our list viewer to show whatever was in that variable. So the process is really the same as when we're storing a single piece of information. The difference is that we're getting a list back rather than a single piece of information. Now let's think about a more complicated example. So far all of the data we've been working with are essentially a series of data all that have the same meaning. For example, we might be storing a list of uh, uh, of solutions. We don't there's there's nothing particularly unique about each particular answer. So we've been storing them all in one list, right? All of these items are essentially the same type of information in theory. However, usually when we're storing data, it has some kind of meaning. So the example I want to use is a phone list. If you think about a phone list, if you were writing it on paper, you'd probably say, okay, there, the phone list is, um, has a name, it has a phone number. And then right after Steve is somebody else, and so on. So we create a list, but each item is really two pieces of information. There's the name and the phone number. So we've really got a list of short lists. Let's think about how this plays out in our Thunkable app. We're going to ask the user to enter their name and phone number. We're going to take those two pieces of information and we're going to put them into a list. Then once we've got those two pieces of data combined into a list, we're going to take those pieces, we're going to take that list, and put it into a bigger list. Put that in here. And then we'll go back and ask them for another piece of information. So they enter a new name and a new phone number. So we get a second entry, and we create a list again, and we take that list, and we store it in our bigger list. And we repeat that process. Now the one thing to keep in mind is when we're creating this shorter list, we would keep reusing that same list. We don't need to create a new list every time. So we simply, in the same way that we reuse the text entry fields, we take that information, we put it into this little list called user, and then we store that user list in the larger phone list. Then when we enter some new information, we put in a new name, new phone number, we update that user list with the new name and phone number and then store it in the next place in the list. So this allows us to build up a bigger list that contains smaller lists. Now you can see that very simply if we'd wanted to add more information, supposing we wanted to add address in here, we could take address and we could have added that into the short list as well. And so now instead of having just name and phone number, we'd have address as part of those short lists as well. So this is the start of kind of understanding how to store larger amounts of data. Let's look at how it works in Thunkable. In this case, we've created an app that has a list. I've got the sub list just to help you understand a little better how the data is going through the process. We've got some add, load, save, and clear buttons and name and phone number entries. 
as well as a button to show us the full list. So let's look at what happens in order to get this started. We run live test and I'm going to type in a name and I'll add that to my list. You can see here's the sub list. So the first field was Eric. Second field was my phone number. The second list is representing where I've taken this sub list and I've put it into a bigger list. So I've got this is like the, the user list that I showed in the first part. And this is the full phone list where all of the data is going to be stored. So I'll store a second piece of information now. And it's added into the list. Once I've created that list, I've now got my phone list. I'm going to take this list, which remember is a list of lists, and I'm going to save that. If I clear the screen and click load, it will pull the same information back. So let's stop now and think about how we would work with this data in a little more of a meaningful way, because right now it's all just crunched together. When I click the load button, I ask local storage to go to a place called my list and give me whatever information is available there. It returns that as value. It says, okay, here's what you asked for in the place called my list. Here's what's there. I then take that information and I assign it to my variable called list. So my variable list now contains the same information. It's a list of lists. In my example, all I've been doing is asking the list viewer to then display that list, which it does, but it doesn't do it very elegantly because it doesn't really know how to work well with this concept of list of lists. So what we need to do is once we've taken that list, we've got it now assigned to variable list, we need to go through that list and break it up into the separate lists. So I want to go through, and this is where we start to use our loops that we've talked about previously. We want to take our loop and go through this list and extract each list on its own and then do something with that data. So we've got our variable list and it has our three sort of sub lists in it for each of the people and their phone numbers. When we use a for loop to go through the list, what we're doing is basically we're asking the list to say, hey, take that first item that's in your list and put it into the variable J. So it's taking this first entry, which is happens to be a list, and putting it into J. So we get that name with the phone number put in there. So on. Then after it's done that, we take a look at that and we say, hey, what's the first item that's in that sub list? And we take that which happens to be the name, and we put it into the names list. Once we've done that, the process goes on to the next item in the list. We get Bob and his phone number, put that into the object name J. So that's a, a sub list. We've pulled a small list out of the big list. His name. And then we ask it to take just the first name and add that to the new list. So it gets added into the names list and so on. And then it repeats that process again for the next entry. We get Susie. Susie's name gets put into J, which then is the sub list and her number. And then we take that. We take the first entry from that sub list and we add it into the names list and so on. And it will continue that process all the way through the list for as many entries are in that list. So just to recap, the variable list that we got out of local storage was a list that contained some very short lists with just two items, which were names and phone numbers. Using a for loop, we basically ask for the first item in the list, which happens to be a short list of two items. We take that, then we take the first item that's in that short list and add that to our names list. And then we repeat that process for each item that's in the list. In this screen, I've created a new variable called names list and I've made it an empty list. The next thing I want to do is to get all of the names out of the data that I've stored. Remember that the list that I stored is a list of lists and all I want right now is just the names. I don't want the phone numbers. So I call the get function of local storage. It returns and I ask it to give what it, give me whatever's in my list and it returns it as value. And I set that value to be equal to my variable named list. At this point, all I've done is pull the information out of local storage into a variable so that I can work with it. 
Now, since I want just the names, I have to go through the data and extract just the names from each sublist in the list. This is where our for each item, or a loop, this is a for loop, this is where this functionality comes in. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying I'm going to go and I'm going to loop through all of the data that was returned here from this value, so whatever was stored in my list, I'm going to go through all of that information, I'm going to find each sublist, and I'm going to extract the name from that. So the loops in Thunkable allow us to go through a list and every time it extracts an item from the list, it assigns it to a variable called J. So in the first case, when I say I go through this list, remember my original list, the first entry was Eric with a phone number. So when I say, hey, give me the first item in the list, it's going to make J a list which has two items in it, Eric and a phone number. Then I'm going to take that information. So I'm going to take this J value. And I'm going to take item number one from it. So I'm just going to say this is now a list. So in list J, get number one. So that's the first entry, which I knew was the name. And I'm going to assign that to my new list that I created called names list. Then I'm going to update my list viewer to show my names list. So let's see how that works. When I start the app, it comes up. And you can see it's extracted just the name of each person that's in that list. It doesn't have the phone number attached to it anymore. The next thing I want to do is so that when I select each person, I get their phone number. So let's look how we're going to do that. You're familiar with the when item in a list viewer is clicked. Now you're familiar with the list viewer function that when we click on an item in the list view, so when we click on an item, it does two things. It returns the item, so whatever was actually in there. So if I clicked on the first item, the item would return as Eric, and the index would return the number of the entry in the list. So if I select the first one, it returns an index number of one. The second item, it would return an index number of two. So think of an index as kind of a pointer, or it's telling you which item in the list you've selected by number. Now what I want to do is I want to take the information that I'm getting, so I take, I, I've got my sublist variable, that was the list, the short list that I was using where I stored the name and the phone number each time you entered the data before it was added into the main list. Then I go through my main list here and I get whatever item number has been selected. So if I click on item number one in the index, that's the number I'm going to use here. And this says, go to the variable named list get whatever is in position number one. If I'd selected the second item, then the index would be two, so the sublist would get assigned to be whatever was in index position two. So in the first position, it was Eric and his phone number. In the second position, it was Bob and his phone number. Once I've got that information, I've assigned that to be the sublist. Now I've got two fields to fill in. I've got two labels here, the name and the phone number that are up at the top of the screen. Now I go to the sublist and I know that I stored the name in the first field and I stored the phone number in the second field. So this basically says go to the first field that's in that sublist and assign it to the label named name. Then go to the second field that's in the sublist and assign that to be whatever's in the phone label. So let's just look at how that's working again. I've got my list of people. If I click on Susie, it changes the labels at the top of the screen to show me Susie's numbers. When I click on Eric, it shows me the name and number for Eric, and the same for Bob. So by using the index number, it allows me to select an item from the main list of data. I use that information then to get a sublist, which includes the phone number and name of whoever's at that index position. And then I use the indexes in the sublist to get the name and the phone numbers. And that, in summary, is how you use lists of lists to keep track of data in a structured way.